Welcome to another One Soccer Player and Putted Hangout. I'm Ace Raymond with Kurt Larson, Oliver Platt, and a very special guest with us today. Yeah, it is Jay Demer, former Watford uh, product, former Vancouver Whitecap FC captain as well, and uh, for, former U.S. men's national team player. Thank you so much for coming on with us, Jay. My pleasure. My pleasure. Always, uh, always nice to be in the room with such lovely gentlemen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know you're a busy guy, so I appreciate uh, taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, from Wisconsin, I understand you're a big Green Bay Packer fan, so I have to get this out of the way right away. <laughs> Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers? Um, well, you know, I, I used to, you know, Brett Favre was my hero growing up, you know, being a soccer player, people always ask, well, who did you, who's your hero, sporting hero growing up thinking I'm just going to say, you know, Eric Cantona or something, but I always say Brett Favre. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. I, I would probably say him circa 2004, okay, yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, he kind of ruined his, uh, his reputation a little bit, you know, people from Green Bay watching him play in a Vikings uniform kind of hurt. It did. It tainted, it tainted his reputation a bit. So I think Aaron took the lead then. And then, you know, once I came back from the world cup, I, I started to actually do quite a bit of work with the Packers um, just, just by being a green Bay product and kind of having that kind of cross mix of football and football, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So I've gotten to work with the club now over the last 10 years and, and really created a great relationship with them and gotten to know a couple of the players and Aaron Rodgers being one of them uh, who actually, you know, I, when I came back from the world cup, and uh, Mason Crosby, the kicker. So, you know, the kicker is always a soccer fan. That's yeah. usually how that works. And then uh, Aaron, of course, uh, he, he, he watched all the World Cup games and things like that. So got to connect with those types of guys uh, over the years. So I'm going to have to say Aaron is now hop Brett as, uh, as, as my number one packer. <laughs> you never, you never uh, Jay, you never wanted to go to the Josh Lambeau route and just try and make the, try and make the switch from MLS to, to NFL kicking? I, I mean, to be to be fair, I, I, I did think about it. Uh, unfortunately, my my hips uh, weren't oh, yeah. allow me wouldn't allow me to do that. But uh, I, I did think about it. I have. Uh, it's funny. We we went uh, this year. I went back to Lambeau Field. I try to go at least once or once or twice a year to get back to to Lambeau. But um, every other year, a group of our friends in Green Bay host a uh, a team uh, called the Japanese Packers cheering team. Okay. And a, a group of a group of Japanese in uh, in in Tokyo that uh, are, are the world's greatest Green Bay Packers fans. That's what they say. And my my good friend from Wisconsin does a lot of work in Japan. Uh, stumbled upon their AGM. So imagine yourself a kid from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, sitting at the corner of a bar in Tokyo, and all of a sudden you see you know fifty to uh, fifty to sixty Japanese all in Packers gear walking by you in a bar going what is going on so he went into that other room and sure enough the whole film the whole room was filled with uh japanese all dressed in all green bay packers gear uh talking about their favorite players and watching a game so that he stumbled upon them and this was five years ago so now every other year the japanese packers cheering team come to lambo and we host I went, to, I went to uh you might know where it is drake university in des moines iowa and quite a few Wisconsin uh, kind of state players came down and played. The fanaticism of Wisconsin fans is not lost on me. I think I, one of my roommate freshman year actually got on the phone with his dad and kept the line open during Green Bay Packer games and during Wisconsin basketball games. So I understand uh, how crazy it is up the, uh, for you guys in Wisconsin. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's, that sounds about right. It's funny because, you know, like, it's one of those places, you know, you, if you're in a, in a big city, you know, that city owns that team. But in Wisconsin, if you're a team in the whole state, then that's your whole team. You know, that's yeah. the thing about Wisconsin. We kind of have ownership over everywhere. Even people from Milwaukee love Green Bay. Would normally in sports, yep. that's not the way it works. Yeah. It spreads beyond that. There are Packer fans uh, everywhere. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we know you're a bit of a, an NFL fan as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on Tom Brady moving to Tampa Bay? You know, I don't like legacy moves, in all honesty. Again, Brett Favre being another great example. Um, it ruins your legacy, in my opinion. You know, everyone's going to see him go to the end of a career wearing 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 red and 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 silver, which is which is different. And 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 I, you know, you do you need an extra thirty million dollars? I get it. <laughs> I, I mean, I get it. I get it. Uh, you know, a thirty million dollars is thirty million dollars, but at the end of the day, is your legacy worth that? I don't it's about know. proving Belichick wrong. It's about proving Belichick wrong. You know that, Jay. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, again, th this is the that that's an ego move, as far as I'm concerned. But you know, if if you want to just you know you know go down as is the greatest quarterback of all time as a Patriot, 
probably could have picked up 15 or 20 to stay. And then, you know, again, what, what do you, you know, is that worth it? I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't, in, in all honesty. But again, I come from a place like Green Bay who has uh, seen a Brett Favre do that and know that it does taint your legacy. Hmm. Yeah, you're, uh, well, you're primarily a two-team uh, pro, uh, with all due respect to, to Northwood FC, it was primarily <laughs> Watford and, uh, and the Vancouver Whitecaps. Uh, uh, let's uh, turn our attention now to soccer, a sport that you chose over football, I understand, as a, as a freshman in high school. Um, yeah, how does this kid from Green Bay, Wisconsin, end up at Watford? Well, that's a, that's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I was I was a kid just like just like most that come from places like Green Bay. You know, I was I was a three sport athlete. Um, you know, again, football, of course, being from Green Bay was our number one sport. If you're a great athlete, generally it's what you play because you want to be a Green Bay Packer. So, you know, I was I was, uh, you know, unlike, you know, just like most kids, you know, in, in, in Wisconsin, um, it's a blue collar state. So, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of different things. Both my parents were, were gym teachers. So I was always in the gym and playing hoops and playing soccer and, um, you know, running track. My dad was a, a, a decathlete and a track coach. So um, I kind of come from, from a long line of track coaches and gym teachers. <laughs> so if you think about kind of where I, where I come from, um, you know, I was 15 years old. I was about five, six, 100, 102, 105 pounds. So I wasn't exactly the biggest guy in the world to keep playing football. So as a 16 year old, I had a decision to make. Do I want to, do I want to play what everyone thinks I should play or, or, or do I want to play what I'm actually better at? And so I, I started to play soccer more on a full-time basis as a, as a 15, 16 year old. It was the only um, sport that I got a scholarship out of college for or out of high school for. I had a, a division three basketball scholarship and a division uh, one soccer scholarship. And those were the only ones that I had. I didn't have a bunch of choice. I wasn't like a heavily recruited player out of, out of high school, of course, uh, you know, knowing my background, but again, knowing my background, I knew that I, I knew that I wasn't going to be someone that was, you know, going down to, uh, you know, the best Gatorade player of a, a player of the week, you know, games and trial games and stuff like that. Like a lot of the uh, ODP players and things like that in the regional, um, you know, leagues in, in America. So I kind of always knew knew my story and I think that that's always really helped me along my journey and you know getting getting to be kind of this gifted scholarship to leave Green Bay you know Chicago University of Illinois Chicago is where I went to school yeah. it's a smaller division one school it's turned into quite a decent program now generally ranked uh, in the top 25 in the NCAA um, you know throughout throughout the years but when I went there you know I was a forward I, I you know I was a goal scorer I was I was basically my high school coach used to coach UW Green Bay so he called up the University of Illinois Chicago um, coach and said hey I got a kid up here I think you might take a look at and just on his word it, it, again this kind of this kind of starts the whole journey of like trying to take things upon myself because there's certain people that have believed in me along the way and and my high school coach he was a 65 year old Italian guy used to coach University of Green Bay got UW Green Bay to their first NCAA championships um, but you know, he was, he was trustworthy. He was like a grandpa figure for me. Um, someone that, that, you know, he, he, if he told me I could play college soccer, I believed him. Yeah. And so they said, you know, I got a guy down in college in Chicago. <clears throat> he knew me and, 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 and knew that I kind of wanted to push envelopes and, and kind of get out of my comfort zone. It's kind of just generally the type of person that, that I am. And Chicago seemed like a great choice for me. So, so I went to Chicago again, as a, as a forward, a, a very not recruited forward season tournament we had a, a, a red card and an injury to the two defenders so there I was my third game ever as a, as a college soccer player and I'm playing defense instead of offense and I'm, 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 I'm at the other end of the field and I, I guess that was kind of the first real step in my journey is to is to have the ability to say yes you know when a coach says hey do you want to change positions and be and, and be something you've never been been before <laughs> you know sometimes in our lives we get we get challenged with those questions and and, and I guess you know, for me, that was one of my big ones. I could have stayed and said, no, I'm a forward. I'm a goal scorer. I'll sit here and wait. But in all honesty, I think as fate would have it, I, I probably would have been the, been the wrong decision. But because I was a kid that, you know, had, had humility built into my program, was coachable, uh, had, had good athleticism as my, as my number one trait. You know, soccer wasn't my number one trait. Uh, you know, as an athlete and a decent competitor. So though I knew what I was good at. I knew my strengths. And I knew that, uh, you know, going to the back line could be something that would give me an opportunity to play. Yeah. 
And sure enough, uh, after three games, I knew that for uh, 17, eight, almost 18 years, I'd been playing out of position. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can't imagine coming out of Green Bay, there's, there's a ton of role models in terms of, you know, becoming a professional soccer player, let alone going to the Premier League and, and to a World Cup. Um, where is, is that belief that you could kind of follow that path and make it into a career? Is that just in your nature? How, how, how did you kind of um, persuade yourself that that was even a viable route for you? Um, oh, well, in all honesty, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, I, again, I, I think as I got towards the end of my college career, you know, again, there was whispers of, oh, you could make a pro. There's some scouts at this game watching you, you know, again, so then you start to plant seeds of like, could I be a professional? You know, mm-hmm. I, I know in my three years of limited experience of playing, you know, college soccer that I've gone from a, a you know, an unknown defender that never played, you know, regional or even for a, a, a good club team to playing three years, changing position, and then becoming an All-American defender in in the NCAA. For me, that's what I looked at. That's what, that was my focus. Again, kind of taking this peripheral, which I get it. I kind of try to look at big picture always. And and, and then all of a sudden a draft comes and it says, oh, Jay Demerit doesn't get picked. So I went through all the rounds. I didn't get picked. So instead of, you know, again, listening and going, oh, I'm not good enough. I guess the world doesn't want me. As a soccer player, I look at, I was able to do those things change my position, learn a whole new position and become one of the best in the nation um, with 300 universities. Uh, You know, why don't I look at that and go, wow, what if I put another three years into this? How good could I be? Now, once that mindset comes in, I go, okay, now where are my opportunities? So my opportunities as a 20, 22 year old, 23 year old was a, okay, I'm going to finish my school first, but get my degree because not only, you know, I I felt I, I owed that to myself, but also wanted to, you know, not have that in my back shoulder, you know, again, so I finishing my degree, my degree was my first step, but then it was about weighing options. And then I had, uh, I had one um, USL one tryout and then I had the Chicago fire reserves, which is the PDL team that I was playing on right there. And, and I, that was kind of a path to maybe being a Chicago fire player, mm-hmm. but again, that was a PDL team. So that's the USL league two, basically. Yeah. So I, I knew either way I'd have to do it the hard way. I knew either way that I would walk on to wherever I was, which is never a great mindset to think consider, considering you're already on the back of the line. And then again, so the other thing, the opportunity was, okay, I have this guy that I played with my, my last year in Chicago at university who's English. And he says, I'm moving back to, uh, uh, back to live with my mom in London. Have you ever thought about playing over there? And I kind of got to thinking, you know, and, and again, laying up those options. And he said, you know, obviously your game kind of suits the English game. So I started to do a little bit more research, started to watch more English games. And I did realize that, you know, you know, if I was going to Spain, I would have said no chance. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But, you know, English, the English game, it's physical, it's tough, it's, it's competitive. Um, You know, again, these are players that generally wear their hearts on their sleeves. Those those kind of uh, English mentalities are, are kind of where my mindset was. So, you know, again, and I'm also a guy with kind of a thirst for adventure and, and doing yeah. things that are pretty out of the box or pretty crazy. So I thought, you know what, I got to do it the hard way. I might as well do it where the light at the end of the tunnel is so much bigger because I had a, I had a college degree, which meant I could have been a product designer and got a, you know, 40 grand job out of college, or I could take a walk on USL2 job and make 18 <laughs> grand. So, you know, if, am I going to do that for monetary reasons alone? No. Uh, but if I can go to England, get an opportunity to live in my friend's house rent free and then start at the bottom of the barrel there, A, that's adventure, B, that's opportunity and C, you know, why not? I got to start somewhere. So, how, so much was your, how much was your first paycheck there? Just, just, just curious. Uh, 40, 40 pounds a game is what I was getting paid. So and who, was, and who was that with? Uh, it was a team called Southall Town. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, I, th- uh, I think they were. UK uh, soccer soccer pyramid um, and uh, yeah and everyone everyone got a little cash envelope just a little white envelope at the end of the game 40 pounds cash I was that like negotiable 20, 20 is that negotiable <laughs> no <laughs> and remember and, and I, I mean I always I always like to remind myself and remind others that you know what I was playing Sunday league there too so that's public mm-hmm. so I'd play Saturdays and Sundays so if you think about this when I landed on English shores as a 20 almost 20 well, I just turned 23 um you know again i was on the bench for sunday and saturday league making 40 pounds in an envelope 20 of it i'd spend on food and 20 of it i'd spend on booze and that was it (laughs) (laughs) yeah and that got me through my weeks for the almost a first that that first whole season and and playing in those leagues 
you know, what I learned about those leagues is, 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 is humility. You know, what I learned about those leagues is toughness. What I learned about those leagues is that, you know, there are players in the, even in the 12th division that are ex pros. So when I started to play against those guys, you'd be like, Oh, you're a pretty good player. Once I, again, once I cracked the bench and once I started to play. So now we're talking mid season, my first year, you know, I started to get kind of like, yo, know, guys that were ex QPR forwards that were now 38 and playing in the ninth division, making 200 pounds a game. <laughs> you know, that guy goes, Hey, you know, you're a pretty good defender. You, you know, like what's your story. So for those, those are the indicators I was listening to. You know, yeah. I wasn't, Oh my God, I'm sitting on a bench making 40 pounds a game. Like if I listen to that shit, I'm done. You know what I mean? Like I'm not doing yeah. that. So I'm, I'm focusing on my, my improvement. I'm focusing on, you know, am I getting better every day? And are the people that know what they're talking about, i.e., you know, England's a very, it's, you know, think of, I always talk about, you know, the English soccer pyramid, 96 teams in one U.S. state. So I always say for people in the States or in Canada that don't really understand, I always say like, what if, uh, what if the NFL was in Washington and Washington and Seattle had uh, three, uh, three CenturyLink stadiums and, yeah. all, and, and all the, t- all the people in, in, in Seattle all wore different colors on a Saturday and hated each other. That's the kind of environment I went into. So for me, it was like the concentration of eyes, let alone the smaller net, let alone the opportunity to get better fast and have people see me because it's so concentrated, just seemed like the right the right path. Even though, again, every morning I wake up and I look outside and it'd be raining and I'd look at my dresser and the mattress on the floor and go, Jesus, am I doing the right thing here? Yeah. Was there a moment... Yeah. Was there, was there, when was that moment where you you maybe move into Watford potentially, but that moment where you're like, I think this is going to be what I do and this is sustainable. And, you know, from the contract negotiation to performing, when was that moment where you're like, I don't have to look back now. I don't have to fall back on my degree. Now I can do this moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm, I mean, I would say the, the defining moment was definitely the Watford contract. I, I would say, though, that I was starting to gain confidence. I had a trial with Oxford United, which was in the third division. And then at the end of my first season, um, I had a, a, another trial with a, a, a third division team called Shrewsbury Town up near Manchester. So I started to get this mindset of there are professional teams wanting me. And again, in a concentrated environment, in a place like England, for me, that meant something because that means that I was looked at and there's so many kids that and players that come from all around the world to London, like all around the world, you know, Nigerians, you know, Norwegians, you name it, they're there. It's the most concentrated hodgepodge of of, of soccer talent you'll ever see in your life, which I always kind of felt privileged to be a part of, but also the fact that I was starting to come out of that bubble and, and, and having success and having teams trying to, to, to ask for my services that gave me the confidence to go into the Watford trial and actually make it. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the Watford trial is fascinating as well. Um, you make the most of your opportunity in these uh, preseason moments, uh, these situations that you find yourselves in, you're yourself in. Uh, uh, what is it about you that uh, helps you rise to the occasion in those instances? Um. I mean, that's, that's a good question. Uh, that's funny because I, I did a TED talk like four years ago in Van- like the TED Vancouver. And uh, that's, that's what they came up with. So when you do a TED talk, you meet with this TED panel and, the, and you just tell stories for a while and, and, yeah. and about your life. And basically they come back to you about a week later and say, okay, we've looked at all your stories. We've done all your things. And the one thing that we want you to talk about, because again, TED talks is one big idea for 18 yeah. minutes. And, and that was there, I think. It says, when you get in these situations where it's time to either rise or sink, uh, you, you've, you've, always been able, you've always been able to kind of get to that other side. And I yeah. think for me, what I learned about my story w- was that, you know, I can call on five moments from how do you make it as a, as a, as a uh, you know, a park soccer player to, to starting in a World Cup. I can define that in almost three, three to four opportunities, you know, and again, and each of those opportunities became this whole new way to, catapult yourself into a stratosphere and I think one of the things is, is, is of course preparation um, I do a lot of a lot of visualization not like in practice but I'm just always always imagining myself in the place that I want to go what happens when I'm there what happens if I get a trial I know I've been sleeping on a floor for a year but you know am I going to mess my chance up if I get it you know absolutely not because I've been in that room a bunch of times I've thought about it 
I'm fit, I'm strong. I put myself in enough games to be ready to perform in those environments. And at the end of the day, you know, you got to take confidence in your own journey. And that's kind of where those, I mean, again, the, the, the story goes for the Watford trial. You know, I had played one, I got, I got, I, I got, I played, I played against Watford in a friendly. They took me on trial because of course, you know, as, as, as time would have it, they didn't have any money to buy any players and they needed a center back. So again, you, you, you do have to, you know, in your journeys, there are times where, you know, say, they say timing is everything. And, yeah. I, and I do think that for me, that timing with Watford was perfect. They didn't have any money to buy any new players. They didn't have, uh, you know, most of their center backs were, you know, Sean Dyche and, and Neil Cox, who are older, great pros, but, you know, 34 and 33 at the time. So they needed some younger blood in there. They didn't have any money to buy anybody. And so I play against them and they bring me in on trial. So when you go to trial in England, it's usually it's two weeks is generally how long you go um, because you can usually play one or two reserve games. So reserve, uh, just like most are, are your, your second team. So these are the, the younger players. These are the subs, the guys that don't really play on a Saturday. So I'm playing a week and a half. I get two reserve games in. They're really enjoying, you know, again, I guess me, you know, what I'm bringing to the table, but again, it's still reserve soccer. You know, we're not talking about, uh, you know, me going out there and playing with Sean Dyche and doing well in front of 30,000 people. It's a very different story, but you know, I get to play two reserve games. They call me in uh, Ray Lewington, who is the uh, now former England and Fulham manager. He calls me in his office and he says, Oh, I've talked to the reserve manager. Um, we, we hear you've been doing really well. He says, we have our last preseason friendly tomorrow against the Spanish La Liga team called Real Zaragoza. Um, why don't you come to the stadium tomorrow? It's our last friendly it's, stadium will be full. Again, Watford's not a huge stadium, but 25,000, you know, it'll, it'll all be there. We'll see if we can get you involved. So again, I'm thinking, okay, I'll this trial list gets to go in. Never trained with the first team, never let alone played. And I walk into the locker room, I got my wind up camera. I'm thinking maybe I'll get a bench spot or maybe I'll get to sit in the stands or warm up with the team. And I walk into the, and on the big whiteboard in the locker room, it, it says demerit as the starting center back. And so I, I'm like, what? The? <laughs> you know what I mean? And again, your, your, your instincts okay. go, I got to go talk to the coach. Like, how did he, how could he do this? You know what I mean? Like he didn't prep me. He didn't show me. He didn't tell me he was going to play me, let alone like start me. And I'm looking at the names. And I never even trained with these guys. You know, these are the starting 10 and then me. So again, and I'm already, I've never played in front of, you know, more than a thousand people in my life. And, and, and now I'm walking out of the stadium and I'm going, oh my God. So that's kind of the, one of the, one of those kind of prep meets, yeah. fear meets all of these moments. So that moment was, was me going and running into the, to the bathroom stall and, and <laughs> not, to shit my, not to shit myself, but to kind of metaphorically shit myself. And, uh, and uh, I, I kind of go in there and I, and I have my head in my hands. And I'm just like, okay, 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 okay. Like, you know, in ult ultimately, I have my two mindsets here. I can, I can go to fear and go, oh, my God, I'm not ready. Oh, my God, why did he pick me? Oh, my God, why didn't he tell me? Start to deflect all these reasons why I wasn't going to do well. But if for some reason in my brain, I'm always like, yes, this is my opportunity. This is why I've been sleeping on a freaking floor for the last mm. year. This is why... I've been putting 20 bucks in my pocket a week. This is why, this is why we do this. This is why you got on a plane with a backpack and that's it. That why, this is what you've been waiting for, you wimp. Why you, don't, don't be wimpy. Don't be, you know, go out there and, and enjoy it. Go out there and, and, and deserve this opportunity. So that, that conversation with myself in that bathroom stall is one of the most important conversations I've ever had because that allowed me to, to, to enjoy the experience, to, to, to take confidence in the fact that I deserve to be there. And I always say that, you know, like I got picked to be there. You know, the fact that the coach picked me to be out there is, should be enough confidence builder for me to, to go out there and play well. You know, it's not like I just picked myself and, you know, somebody picked me. So therefore that means they must have confidence in me. So therefore I need to take that confidence in myself instead of saying, oh, I'm not ready for this. Oh my God, why didn't he tell me? Oh my God, I've never played with these 10 guys. So that kind of mindset in those big moments was, is always kind of what's helped me into those next levels. And, yeah. you know, I walked out of that tunnel. I got to play against, you know, uh, David, famously enough, David Villa was the forward for Real Zaragoza that night. You know, but again, he's a little guy. I love playing against little guys that are athletic and fast because I can match them athletically, but I can beat them physically. So, you know, I just did that. I constantly, in those big moments, you know, one of my always mindsets was always just control what you can control. Yeah. You know, if, if I'm not good at left foot passing out of the back, why would I do that in a game like that? You know, control what you can control, do what you're good at, 
and then and and and, uh, and 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 take confidence in the fact of these great opportunities. And so th that kind of mindset always always put me in a pretty good state. And, and sure enough, we lost two one, but thankfully, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't play bad. I didn't ha give away any goals. And, and and after that game, Ray Lewington calls me into his office and he said, "Well," and he kind of laughing and he says, well, "What did you think?" And I kind of looked at him. I said, I think you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, should have, you, know, you, you, didn't, you didn't tell him that you thought David Villa was a good matchup for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> me on the seven. Confident. Uh, you mentioned the left foot. Um, one thing I've heard you say in the past, Jay, is that uh, you do your work in the dark and then shine when the spotlight's on. Uh, uh, that left foot, you worked on it. So tell us a little bit about that and how you, you developed uh, all aspects of your game. Yeah, I mean, I always when I you know I do a lot of youth program stuff now and, and develop a lot of players, and I, and I think it's important, you know, again that my, that that mantra that that kind of do your work in the dark, and, and I always say kind of in the meantime of like it's like do what you're bad at in the dark. You know, there's no reason to make mistakes when there's everyone watching. So when there's everyone watching, do what you're good at. Concentrate on your strengths. Play play your best game. Don't get out of your, don't get out of what you know control what you can control. So that means if I'm not good at hitting left foot diags, why would I take to, to prove to 30,000 fans that I can do it. Well, no, because I'm, I'd actually, that, that can work negatively if you shank it out of bounds and everyone starts booing you. Just, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So that's kind of was always my idea. So once that happened, I, I would, I would, you know, again, I, thankfully I was, I was of a mindset to always ask questions. And so my big, my biggest, you know, I guess weight uh, on me or anchor at that time was my, my left foot passing out of the back. So forwards were closing me down from the left side or from the right side, making me to my, go to my left. So I knew that people were watching me. So what that ha what happens is I'm not going to work on that in front of 30,000 people. But after the after training every day, I'm going to go to the wall in the corner of the training ground, and I would take chalk or, or, or tape, and I would draw X's, hundreds and hundreds of touches. All right, you know when I my last year at college, when I started to realize that I could potentially play pro, I would go to the racquetball courts at, at my university, and I would just take one ball and draw X's all over the walls, and uh, and then I just started hitting them. You know, again, chips, small passes, big die eggs from the back of the court. So I, I guess we just, I would find ways creatively to work on my touch, but still make it fun where it wasn't like, oh God, I got to go do this and work on my left foot because I suck at it. It was kind of like finding creative ways that, uh, that I could do that in the dark when no one else was watching, mm -hmm. making a bunch of mistakes. And then as I started to get more games, as I started to play for Watford, those things just kind of went away because not only do you play with better players, which means you're not so isolated all the time. You know, that's one thing I learned when I started playing pro is that the guys around you are much better. So therefore you just got to do what you're good at. And that's defend, yeah. that's arc, mark good, good forwards, you know, shut down those people and be simple on the ball. So in a way that kind of helped all so much when I was starting up, um, but also just concentrating on what I can control in when no one, when no one, when no one else mm -hmm. was watching. I'll let uh, Ollie get a question in here before we get to the U.S. men's national team because I think that uh, Kurt, being a fanboy, is going to take over that portion. So, <laughs> former fanboy, former fanboy. I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm a professional now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Ollie. Just just before we move on from from Watford, I was I wondered it, when you were promoted to the Premier League and you're playing against some world class players, Thierry Henry and so on. Was there ever ever anyone who kind of did intimidate you or, or overawe you a little bit in that division? Um, I mean, yeah, I've famously been burned by, uh, by a couple of those players. I, I think um, <laughs> uh, the, the Henri one was a good one. Henri and Drogba are basically the yeah. two guys that I've had the, the most problems with. Um, uh, again, You're probably not alone there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. You've got decent company. Uh, <laughs> I, I, again, I, I, I mean, again, the Vias, the Roonies, the, you know, those types of guys I always enjoyed playing with. Um, um, but the guys like a Drogba who are 6'2", 195 pounds, you can't beat him in the air. You can't beat him by strength. You can't beat him by footwork. You, can, you, know, you, you can't close him down too quick because they'll, you know, they'll, they'll burn it by you. You can't, you can't hold off too long because they'll hit him from 25 yards out. So those are the games where you really feel. And we, for what, for some reason, we always drew Chelsea in the FA Cup. So I ended up playing against Drogba like, four times in two years and he had a hat trick on us he scored two the other time and it was just you know those types of guys that were big strong fast but kind of I couldn't find ways to beat them so I would say those two guys for me were, were the toughest all right to, to the U.S. men's national team now you finally get the call up uh, at 27 years old so uh, what was that moment like for you I, I mean 
the national team is, is, is the ultimate, you know, that's the badge you all want to wear. You know, you grow up watching world cups in America, of course, you know, that was the once every four years in my, you know, adolescence, but you know, you know what that means. And you know, that, you know, Olympics isn't a thing for soccer players when they're pro, you know, they're, they're you know, it's a, it's a U23 in the Olympics. So that kind of opportunity had, had passed for me. So again, there was only this huge light at the end of the tunnel. So when you start your journey, you know, again, I, I wasn't, necessarily believing that I could do that but you know as you progress throughout your journey that that became a reality you know and I, and I think the same as always the good thing about being called in as a 27 year old is that I had had two seasons in England under my belt you know so I was playing against Brad Friedel already here already I was playing against it, it which was kind of a strange unique experience for me because I was going out with, for beers with those guys in, and I had, I had never even played for my national team before. Yeah. So it was really strange for me as a 27 year old to walk into my first camp as a rookie and sit with the head table. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was kind of one of those kind of strange, strange things for me, but, but one that I, I had to take confidence in because again, I, if I was playing against the, you know, the McBrides and, and those kind of guys every week in England, I, I felt like I did deserve to be there even though I was late to the party, even though, again, I, I built that humility or carried that humility with me when I would, did walk in, you know, thankfully I was just sitting with those guys and chatting and being one of their teammates. But I, I thankfully, I, I think I was able to skip a lot of steps as to like, you know, normally you get your first cap and then it, like, you got to wait for a long time. And, you know, for me, it was kind of like, it was, it was nice to be able to walk in and have the, have the coaches have enough confidence to play me because they knew that I was already doing it for my club. And, 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 and in, even in my second and third year at, at Watford, you know, I, I was my second year is when we got promoted. Again, I was I got promoted. Um, you know, I scored the goal that got us there, man, a match for 80,000 people, you know, and then I was a Premier League player and I'd never even trained or played with my national team before. So, you know, again, I understood that dynamic, but I also, you know, knowing my story and knowing how long that I had come you know, I, I did take confidence in that. I did feel like I deserved to be there. And I was, even though I was a little bit too late to the party, but, um, you know, I think that helped me kind of climatize myself to that team a little bit quicker, say, than some of the other late bloomers that may have just been happy to be there. I went in there with purpose because I knew that for, even from a club's perspective, I was already becoming a leader within that club in two years or less. So why couldn't I do that for my national team? And that yeah. really kind of put me in the mindset to go and be a part of the team and, and, and hit the ground running. Jay, I have, a, I have a bit of a unique kind of um, perspective on this, given I'm a dual citizen of, of uh, the U.S. and Canada, a little bit younger than you. But I grew up in that era of, um, you know, the 2002 World Cup through the 2006 disappointment. But then the 2010 World Cup was exciting for American fans. Um, you had mentioned, you know, what it meant to be called up to the U.S. national team. Does it? Does it still have that meaning in the States right now? Because there's just it just feels different right now with the U.S. national team and the sentiment around it and the importance of it. Do you feel that, too? I do. I do. And, and, and again, I, I like talking about this kind of stuff because I, I, I want to know where the J.D. Merits of now are. I want to know where the Brian McBrides are. I want to know where, you know, I, I suppose the gritty guys you know, essentially as Americans, that should be built within us, the Rockies of the world. You know what I mean? Where are, where are those people? Uh, and again, I think the system has allowed us to not find them. I feel like the system has, um, you know, created these players that are good technical players. They're great athletes. They are, uh, um, you know, very well drilled in the sport, but have they taken enough hits to create humility? Have they, do they have the, uh, you know, the, the balls to stand in a room and, and, and be criticized or to put themselves into situations that they haven't been in before to uh, create adversity? Have they had enough adversity in their lives to know the occasion that they're walking into other than wearing red, white, and blue? In my opinion, probably not. I was seeing, that was always what attracted, I think that's what drew, I think, American soccer fans to that team where the guys like you, the guys like Brian McBride, the guys like a Chris Armas. And if I understand you correctly, I don't see that same attraction anymore between supporter and player currently in the U.S. system. 
No, and, and and I would, I mean, I would say that across the board, you know, again, I don't think U.S. is that different. You look at, you know, some of the young players coming through for their countries, you know, I, I we just live in more of a, I, I'm not going to say privileged, but I'm going to, I might say privileged world um, where, you know, again, academy programs aren't like they used to be, you know, you used to have to clean your boot. I remember when I first got to Watford, I was cleaning their forwards boots and you know, trying to get a tip for my Christmas bonus and like, you know, making 20, 20 grand a year, you know, you know what I mean? Like in the boot room with like these brushes at eight, eight in the morning before you can go get breakfast, you've got to go clean the first team's boots. You know what I mean? And, 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 and the first team guys are having a go at you and they're kicking you and they're not letting, not giving you a day off. You yeah. know, and that's the, kind of, that's the kind of stuff that I believe creates grit. I, that's what I believe creates this kind of humility. It's what I believe gives the hierarchy of how you got to make it, you got to get there. And when you do, you better, you better believe that that stripe is worth way more than just an Adidas contract because it is, but I, I don't think we create that mindset anymore. We create privileged kids that think that they're just going to make it and be the next LeBron James or Lionel Messi or Landon Donovan when they don't really have the tools to do that. And they don't have the mindset to, to go through adversity or to be, you know, the, the players that we all want them to be as American soccer fans. Yep. You know, yes, yeah. I love the Pulisics. I do. I do think that mm. he's the next best thing. But again, he's created that grit by moving to Germany as a teenager, sitting there getting balls rifled at him and, and, and working his way through the ranks in Germany where they don't take a day off. You know what I mean? The, the, these things have been created through that. Are our American soccer systems creating those players? Absolutely not. Well, that's been kind of the interesting debate in, in U.S. soccer, right, is you have, as Kurt said, fans who loved those gritty, physical, heart on their sleeve teams. And then you have, you know, a couple of coaches recruited when you look at, at Clinton. Teams that won, too, by the way. Their teams yeah, that won. won. No doubt. Their teams and, that won games at World Cups. For sure. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have Klinsman and Berhalter come in and kind of trying to change the style of play and, and the philosophy of the program a little bit. Is, is that the wrong thing to do, do you think? Do you think they, they've lost too much of, of what? made the team successful in the first place um i do i i do again i think um you know again in my opinion jürgen jürgen brought a, a a great focus on on how far you can go again i do believe that if, if you stand a guy in front of a team that's won a world cup that cr instantly creates amount of respect that is deserved and and therefore creates a new mindset that we can achieve that too but he tried to turn a German into an Amer or American into a German. Very hard to do. You can't do that, you know, because Americans are built from other things. We're not machines. We're not people that are going to, you know, listen to the way that, that, that the Germans were built. Again, no disrespect to the German way because they win World Cups. I'm not saying that's wrong. But I think it's a very difficult thing to create an American and turn him into a German type thinking, mechanical type setups. I, I thought that that's where he failed. He didn't use that American spirit in a way because he didn't understand grit because he doesn't, he, do, he doesn't come from systems that are created with them. He, he, he understands German footballers that do exactly what they should do in a very mechanical way. And this position is required for this. And you go out there and you do it very well. It's all little cogs to the wheel in America. It's very hard to, to create. I think he, he almost did it. But I don't think he picked the right players to fit to fit those positions, and and, and I think that um, I, also with him it got a little bit mid, mid about him, you know he, he was a guy that that really, you know he would change positions because of all of a sudden we win five one now he's the messiah for American soccer. So for me those things turned into more of like him, instead of how do I create the best team based on the the pool that I have. And, and again, he didn't pick the gritty players. He picked Germans that did hardly, you know, you know, you know, that weren't even from America. And then you mix that with the Americans. And then you, you mix that whole dynamic of where are we? And, and, and does that work? And, and it, it, it worked in, in, in phases, but never enough to build that foundation of what's required to go and win games in a World Cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because I think uh, we, all, we all hear what Jurgen has said uh, ever since leaving uh, the program. Uh, I've multiple shows now that we've done here. I've kind of talked about how I used to be a massive, massive team and the Klinsman era basically just killed it for me because it took away everything. Uh, I thought we were the United States, uh, were, but 
you know, can you offer any insight into what you were hearing during Klinsman's time there from players you knew inside the camp? I mean, I know he didn't, he didn't prefer you during his time, but did you, can you share anything that you just kind of heard coming out of there? Yeah. I mean, again, it was kind of similar, you know, again, I don't, I, I'm not a bad blood kind of person, but again, it shows, you know, he was very much an active player. He didn't want guys like me, you know, he wanted guys that, that, that would take a touch out of the back and look pretty and, and lose their defenders in the box. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know, you know what I mean? That's what, it, that's, that, that, that's what happened. And, 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 you know, again, that, that, that's no disrespect to, to, to players anywhere. It's just, again, it's just, who do you want to build your team from? And, 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 and I guess, um, you know, he, he did that on, on a very, um, on a very, uh, uh, you know, across the board level that seemed to fit his system, but what was his based on? It wasn't based on how do I find this really unique group of American players and American characters that can go off and wear a badge and a flag and go out and fight for their country. Like a lot of teams, like Bob Bradley's teams did. Yeah. Because what Bob Bradley did was find an eclectic group of guys that actually loved playing with each other and for each other. And all Bob had to do was think about tactics. It didn't matter what pieces he put out of that puzzle because he knew that each of those pieces would go out and do their job because they were A, prepared, be part of a tactical system that they understood and C were allowed to go out and be the players that they were. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, 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 I actually listened to a podcast that Bob did a couple, um, a couple uh, months ago with Hurt Gomez. And, you know, he talked about, you know, our Spain game and things like that. And, and then he talked about the Spanish team itself. And he talked about how, you know, we live in a world now where, um, you know, the PKs are, are the center backs. He says, but what about the Puyos? What about the guys that are, you know, taking the game by the scruff of their neck, putting, and then he, he kind of coined that to, to, to kind of the, the, the you know, and he even said my name. He said, what happened to those guys? The guys that are out there that would put their head through a wall for the team. And they, yeah, they might not look pretty, but damn right, they're going to go out there and do a job. And, 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 and again, I think we lost that. We think we lost that under Klinsman. And, and I think, again, because he was taking a German mentality and looking for German players instead of American players that were willing to yeah. do that. I know. And I feel like the U.S. team got really, really lucky and fortunate during the 2014 World Cup under him. Michael Bradley disagrees with me. He pulls me aside. Uh, he pulled me aside a few years ago and told me I was wrong about that take, but that's okay. <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted to ask you real quick um, just about – Michael and about Josie Altador, two players who I think have um, contributed a ton to U.S. soccer, uh, two players that are here in Toronto that I've covered for a long time that I used to interact with quite frequently. I know how they feel. Um, but in the U.S. now, it just seems like they are completely disrespected every time, every time they're even in an MLS stadium. I'm just wondering what you think about that you know what do you think of Michael and Josie kind of just being disregarded now by the U.S. soccer fan base um I mean I I agree with you I, I think that uh, those guys again if you look I, I always look at like how do I respect a player and and and, uh, and one is the ability to do it over and over and over again uh, that these guys have been doing it over and over and over again at the highest level for a very very long time um, so again, instant respect for both of those guys. I've watched them both evolve as players and certainly as leaders, you know, I, I, you know, Michael from the beginning, everyone thought he could be, you know, again, under his dad was like, Oh, do I want to be a leader? Are, are people going to think I'm leading just because it's my dad's team? You know, he kind of, I felt like Michael always kind of, you know, just stayed in his lane under his dad. And, and, and again, it was a great lane because his, his dad picked him. His dad gave him a great role um, to play in. Uh, but I, I, I loved how he has kind of over the years stepped into more of a leadership role. Um, I, I love his consistency. You know, again, he's a he's a controversial character from the fans' perspective because, uh, you know, he he doesn't score tons of goals or doesn't like he's not flashy. He's 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 a, he's your he's your general engine room that's not going to do, um, you know, too many flashy things. But he's always out there. He's always consistent. And he's always a good leader. And, and, and you know what you're going to get from Michael Bradley every game. And for me, that's what I love about him. Um, Josie, I would say, um, again, when I watch Josie take a leadership role and actually take a game by the scruff of his neck, there was no more of a dominant player over the years up front for the U.S. national team than Josie Altidore. The thing with Josie was that I wanted to see him do it every day. And, and, and again, I think it took 
to probably when he got to Toronto to take more of that leadership role to see him do it more and more every day. And I think that's when I saw the best Josie Altador that I've seen. I just wonder, yeah, and I just wonder, typically guys with that many caps for national teams, they just, there's a certain bit of respect among the fan base of that country. I just wonder why that's been disregarded or if they're just kind of, you know, the faces of being in this bad phase for the U.S. and people kind of blame them as the, uh, you know, the current leaders in that setup. That would just be my take. I was just wondering if you had a, a, a similar take on that. A good point. I think that's a good point. And, and, and you know, again, I, do, I would say that that group, you know, again, you look at the leaders in the group before. So the, my group was like the Boca Negras, the Howards, the, you know, these are big characters. These are guys that are, are going to take that leadership role, relish that leadership role. Michael's a good leader, but I don't know if he ever wants that leadership role. I think he kind of learned it because he's a, he's a good player and he's been put in that role. But it, did he want to put himself out there? Probably not in the beginning. Does Josie want to carry the team on his back? Probably not. You know what I mean? I, I, but again, maybe that's part of it. You know, you got to want the leadership role in order to be that leadership character that I feel like fans, especially fans that don't actually see the depth of their character, that that's what Americans, some most, you know, I'm not going to disrespect American soccer fans and say that they don't know the depths as well as they probably should. Yeah. But they probably don't. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I would say that they have probably gotten a hard, a hard realm, but I, again, are they flashy? Are they, what are, what are American fans going to look at? How many goals, how many hat tricks has Josie had against Mexico? How many yeah. hat tricks you You want legendary status. That's what you got to do. You want to be this person that can't do anything wrong. You've got to find those big moments that Americans will hold on to. And I don't know if those guys have created enough of those moments for them to create the legacy that now at the end of their career, they're not going to have some kind of blame or say that they weren't X. So I think that was part of the reason too. All right. Well, we've uh, touched on your professional career, your uh, time with the U S uh, national team, uh, break it down. If you can, we're going to put you on the spot here a little bit, Jay, your top three matches uh, that you played in. Uh, top three, I'll say definitely the playoff final. Uh, again, that was kind of my, my Jay demerits on the map yeah. game. Uh, again, not only to, in front of 80,000 people, but also um, um, just to that kind of that game itself culminated the journey. You know, that journey, you know, again, was four years in the making. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people don't see the stuff in the dark. And so for me, that was like a really good um, kind of I am here and I'm hopefully here to stay moment. Uh, and, and again, my parents and all my friends and family and a lot of the players I played with in that 12th division team were in that stand that day. So that, that moment itself was, was definitely uh, one number two uh, Spain, you know, and again, when we, when we walked into that stadium in South Africa in, in 2009 in the Confederations cup, no one, you know, to snap Spain's dominant streak, but to do it willingly and, and doing it where we des it deservingly for me was, was a great um, moment because I'm a team guy. I, I really relish teamwork. I, I, I love it. I love being a part of something bigger than myself. And that game, more than any game I've ever played in, was, 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 was teamwork personified. You know, these are guys, again, I talk about Bob Bradley and his ability to create a group of 11 that want to go out there and fight for each other. That was, that was that game. You know, everybody stayed in their lanes. Everyone did exactly what was required of them in that game. Um, you know, cutting down space, Ricardo Clark right in the back of me. Michael doing his job, you know, Tim making great saves when called upon, you know, you know, the whole team getting behind the ball, not, not giving those guys any team space, any time to play, you know, again, Josie nipping at PK's heels, stealing that ball, pushing him out of the way, using his shoulders, hitting, finding the corner. You know, again, you, you think about those games where everyone comes and, and really just does their jobs, but it becomes easy. I was against the best team in the world by a mile and we deserved that game because that's what we did. So that's, that's probably number two. And number three was uh, England, England, 2010 world cup. You know, when you, when you walk out of that tunnel to be a representation of, of the top 11 in the world's biggest sporting event on the planet, you know, that, that for me was, is the ultimate, you know, when you get to put on your country's colors and go fight in, a, in, in those types of environments, that that's what every player wants, whether they want it when they get there or not is a different story. But, you know, for me, you know, all that work that had done that, but also to stand in the tunnel against the country that gave me my career 
was extra special, you know, yeah. to, to stand in that tunnel and know that, you know, playing against England, when I know the people in the stands and my, the Watford fans at home were, were like, wow, I get to cheer for an American <clears throat> against my country. Environment to be in, you know, not only against the country that gave me my life, but also, you know, to put on red, white, and blue and have your hand on your heart and hear your, hear your, your, uh, your national anthem to know that you're representing your country is the ultimate moment. Uh, we just got a few uh, more questions to get to. Only 10 minutes left, Jay. We appreciate you coming on with us uh, here at One Soccer. Uh, I want to get your take on uh, the new Canadian Premier League. And one thing that they have in place is a 1,000 minutes for players under 21. Uh, how do you feel about uh, the structure of the league with that in mind? Um, I like it. Uh, I, development is key. You know, again, how is someone going to know they can play in front of 30,000 if they've never done it? You know what I mean? So again, I, I think that um, it's a slow burn. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that people should get excited right away. I think that it's going to be five years before we get to what we think that CPL will be. Uh, again, I think that soccer is still growing very much um, here to make people understand the game and then therefore want to be in the stands to cheer in it. I think, you know, again, soccer in Canada has been along for a long time, but I think now again, ownership groups are starting to see the potential of it. Players yeah. are starting to believe that they can play in these leagues and do well and, 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 ho and hop into some of these leagues and, 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 be, and do a good job. So I, I think, I, you know, I, I talk to Russell Tybert all the time and he's, you know, he's, he's a long-term white cap Canadian international. And he used to just be so happy to get called up to go play against Honduras or Nicaragua. And I'd be like, why aren't you guys going to Nicaragua and winning? You know what I mean? For, so for, the, for, for me, like a lot of the Canadian players they're really good players they're just as good as anyone i've played with on the national team or guys like stel terry or guys i used to play with in the premier league over in, in, in england there's all there's been good canadians for a long time but for me when they all come together it's like they're happy to be there instead of we're here to win because we're good individual players and we're canadian so let's go fight for each other because that's built in the canadian mentality too and that's what the hockey team does they come in and they're like we're the best in the world we're gonna win i'm not gonna look at 33 million people and go oh it's the, it's the population I'm not, I'm not believing that for a second. I'm going in saying it. For me, it's a belief system. And, and I think that Canada is starting to learn that and it's starting to see that and it's starting to start with some of their players like the Alfonso Davies of the world that are now going, I'm Canadian, I'm proud and I'm going to go out there and be a damn good Canadian. And, and, and I think that's going to start to transfer into the national team and then therefore down to the CPL. So I do see the future being, being bright. Uh, again, I think Canadians are like North, and North, general North Americans. They're good athletes. They have good mindsets. For the most part, you know, again, we're working on those. <laughs> again, I think the mindsets aren't what they used to be in North American sport culture. Um, but, um, you know, I do see a, a bright future for the CPL. I think it's right. I do think that there's enough of an audience and an education in the fan base to make it successful. Um, and, and, and again, just judging by their national team, it's looking like their players are coming in with more confidence. You know, again, they want to go and beat America. And, they, and again, they have and they can. So again, I think that's a wake up call for Americans to go, okay, you want to be good in CONCACAF? We better get your shit together. And I, and, I, and, I, and I agree with a lot of the points that have been on this podcast is that how that happens is going to take a bit of a shift. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing if that happens because if not, it looks as though the Canadians are coming. All right, five more minutes. Uh, yeah, you talked about the two programs, uh, US and you play. Uh, your thoughts on, on those two matches, Jay? Uh, again, I, I saw a Canadian team that had, a, had something to prove. Uh, I saw a Canadian team that uh, has good enough players like they always have to go and perform. Um, again, I, I watched Alfonso rise. Uh, you know, he was a white cap. You know, he used to play with yeah. us when he was 15 years old. I was captain of the team at the time. Um, you know, so I've watched him turn into the, uh, the fantastic player that he is. Um, you know, again, you can see his drive. You can see his talent. You can I see also saw a Canadian team lose 4-1 in Orlando. <laughs> that's true that's true and, and, and again I, I i i think that again which team showed up that day and, and, and again it was a team that that probably had had a good performance and then thought they had made it <laughs> a little bit but, you, you know what i mean so it, it's, it's like one of those things that i i would like to see from a managerial standpoint someone cracking the whip a little bit more trying to keep a little bit better humility within the group creating adversity creating grit you know, those things are hard to create, uh, but I, I do think that you can. I do think that there are North American players, both in Canada and the U.S., that aren't getting shots. Again, the jaded merits of the world um, in, the, in the North American culture. 
Um, I'd like to see more of those in both teams. You know, where are those guys getting shots to get up there and perform? Believe me, they're there. You know, I'm not this all-important special player. I was just someone that deserved opportunities and made the most of them when I got them. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason that there aren't more Canadians and Americans that can do that, of course. And that's kind of where, you know, again, shifting gears into what I'm doing now yeah. is, is, is that, that that's what I'm trying to do with Rise and Shine, you know, and, and, and again, you know, that's my goal as a, as, a, as a mentor, as someone that is a former alumni of those programs and has, you know, an incredible amount of experience from playing in front of two ducks and a cow to, you know, again, having your hand in your heart, being one of 11 to represent your country for the, in the biggest country, you know, tournament on the planet. So, you know, within that, I want, I am starting to lend my experience and, and my, um, you know, mindset in, into those environments. Yeah. Expand on that a little bit more. Uh, you mentioned the word grits over and over again. I think we should maybe set up a counter for how many times you said the grits, the word grits uh, <laughs> in this uh, chat. But uh, yeah, well, what is uh, the message behind Rise and Shine? What's it all about? And what are you doing right now with it? Uh, well, Rise, Rise and Shine was uh, uh, famously a, a Kickstarter project in 2011 when I came back from the World Cup. Um, you know, we famously, well, they famous, these two non-filmmakers approached me just before the, the World Cup and said, if you make it to the World Cup, the story needs to be told. You know, the kids from North America or in America need to see that, that these types of things can happen. So they hired a guy on Craigslist, sent him to the World Cup to get video footage. Um, and then uh, a friend of mine uh, who had a big marketing background in L.A. Uh, created a Kickstarter campaign. And in 2011, when no one even knew how to donate money online, uh, he raised $223,000 from the passion soccer community to turn my, my, my story into a documentary film called Rise and Shine. Mm -hmm. The Jay Demerit story. And, and, and within that, you know, I watched that campaign come to fruition with thousands of people that I have never met before. You know, these are people that were running, that had seen the World Cup, had, had seen my story through a lot of the news outlets and stories telling that that happens throughout a World Cup in the media and just got behind it. You know, again, I, I think to, to, to your point, Kurt, was, was just like people knew that story and they loved that story and appreciated that story as Americans as as world soccer fans to say oh i love this story i want to support it and but when when you're the subject of that you know again i watched you know this 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 tally start going up and going up and going how is this happening and then all of a sudden when they hit two hundred and twenty thousand dollars after 70 days it just you know it, it gave me a purpose and it, mm -hmm. it was like if if i have people that i don't even know that are donating to this story i need to be the one that personifies it and tells it yeah. and, and, and gets it out there so you know, Rise and Shine for me became my next mission. As I finished playing, you know, Rise and Shine is now a youth program. So I run a youth program that really teaches the story of how to be a holistic, um, not only in your skill set, but in your mindset. I surround them with mentors that are professionals in other fields from design to chefs to, um, you know, finance people to other Olympians and other sports. And, you know, I surround them with, 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 with highly professional people in all fields that really mentor these kids. And, so the, the physical program is a four day program up in the mountains of Pemberton, where I live now in British Columbia. Yeah. Uh, we put the kids through 15 hour days. Um, you know, the kids are cooking meals with the chef that's on site and they teach them about food and what's in it. And we do smoothie stations so the kids can learn what's in their food. And, and then they go meet an Olympian at lunch and they talk about what it's like to win a, a gold medal in swimming. And then we do a swimming exercise with the kids at the, at the big lake to show them that, you know, swimming mindset's no different than what it takes to go kick a goal. So with, within that becomes this whole idea of how to create a high-performance mindset. Once you can create that, you can go out in front of 80,000 people and perform because it's, yeah. you know, when you're prepared. So that, that, that was kind of the base of what Rise and Shine is, why we create it. And then I use the story as a way to show people that these types of things are possible. When you put yeah. yourself in the youth program are, are in order, belief, respect, work ethic, and positivity, because first you got to believe you can do it. Second, you got to build respect in the room. And that's for yourself. That's for your teammates. That's for the environment that you're stepping into. All of those things are built on respect. From there, it moves into the work ethic stage of like, you got to work. You know, work ethic is, is, is the ability to do it every day. Hard work is now a byproduct of what it takes. So you can't just tell kids to work hard anymore. You got to say like, why do you get out of bed every day? And are you doing it with the right purpose? Yeah. So that starts the work, but what also people and kids don't understand is when you got to work hard, what happens next is the adversity. Yeah. Cause if you're working hard, it's guaranteed. It, it means you're generally getting out of your comfort zone. And when you get out of your comfort zone, what's guaranteed to happen is adversity shit that you didn't think was coming. 
injuries, not yeah. getting picked, um, again, losing your job, you know, again, not, not, you know, being able to afford living in a place that you want to live. These are adversities that are guaranteed to happen in your life. And if you're not ready for them, then generally that you're going to go and, and, and either feel sorry for yourself or, or, or quit. And, and you and overcame all of that. And that's what makes your story so inspirational. It sounds like an amazing program uh, that you have set up with Rise and Shine. Jay, uh, I want to sign myself up for it. So it's motivational. Mm. And uh, I'm sure I could <laughs> learn a lot from it. So I appreciate you coming on. This is all the time we have for today. We'd have to do this again, though. It's been amazing. Yeah, I, I have a lot to talk about, as you guys know. But, uh, <laughs> you know but, that, but that's the journey. You know what I mean? When, you, when you've done you know, the lowest of the low to the highest of the highs, there's a lot of stories in there, you know, and, and for me, yeah. it's always a pleasure. And, and again, it, it's, I, I feel it's my purpose to tell those stories. It's my, it's my purpose to sit in as many rooms as I can and, 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 and make sure that people know that these types of things are possible. And, and, and Rise and Shine isn't just a soccer story. It's a life story. And, 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 and you know, again, it's my job to do those types of things. And, and again, sit in rooms like this. So again, thank you for, uh, for having me today and, and any time. Uh, we can sit and spitball stories. Uh, I'm happy to do that again. Yeah, one of the most inspirational stories out there. We want to thank everyone for watching on our uh, One Soccer YouTube stream. Uh, yeah, Adam Jenkins is back tomorrow for the Hangouts. So Gareth Wheeler show uh, premieres later today. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Cheers. Jay. My pleasure, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, man. That was great.